Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the lunchtime lecture series here at the National Portrait Gallery. I'm Fiona Smith, the adult program manager. <coughs> Very delighted to welcome Dr. Philip Mansell to the gallery today. Philip's the author of the latest biography of Louis XIV and is going to be discussing the contradictions in his, in his personality and policies and the reasons for his continued public fascination um, and also with Versailles. The Sun King and his grandiose style of monarchy that has influenced subsequent French rulers, including President Macron. <laughs> He's going to be looking at how, for a time, um, he will also be looking at how, for a time, Louis dominated England through Louise de Kerouai. Carwell. Carwell. Let's call her Carwell. <laughs> the Duchess of um, Portsmouth and Dauphiny. Um, who was Charles II's principal mistress and um, the only woman to be created a duchess in her own right in two countries. And her portrait um, by De Detroit, it usually hangs upstairs, but sadly you can't visit her today because she's currently in Australia. <laughs> um, she's um, most recently been at Bendigo Art Gallery um, as part of a travelling exhibition called Tudors to Windsors. Um, so, um, Philip's going to be discussing how Louis' use of women as political agents and, um, and also his concern for their education um, were some of his most original policies. <coughs> Philip is the author of 13 books um, on French and Ottoman history. In 1995, he helped found the Society for Court Studies with David Starkey and Simon Shirley, and in 2012 received the London Library Life in Literature Award. His um, previous book to this one was Aleppo, The Rise and Fall of Syria's Great Merchant City, published in 2016. And after today's lecture, Philip will be signing copies of King of the World, um, The Life of Louis XIV, and that will take place in the gallery's bookshop, which overlooks the ticketing desk in the main hall. Um, Philip's happy to take your questions at the end, but please join me now in welcoming you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fiona, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be here, one of the best museums in London with most fantastic portraits. And I want to talk about Louis XIV through space as, as well as time today, the different countries he tried to dominate, not just England, but even as far as Siam and China. And really because I think the key to his character is conquest and power. And here you see him uh, defeating the Khan, the rebellion from 1648 to 52, when he was young. This statue is, you can see it at Chantilly, north of Paris. And what, how did he see his power, not just as a sacred king of France, but also as a war leader? And here is the inscription on some of his canon that you can see in the courtyard of the Invalide in Paris, Ultima Ratio Regum, the last argument of kings, is in fact canon or power. And I think that really is the key to Louis XIV. Nancy Mitford said that Versailles was the love of his life. I think it was the French army and particularly his picked guards. And he himself on his deathbed told his great-grandson, the future Louis XV, that he had loved war too much. All his life, every day, he was with his troops, drilling them, checking on the quality. He was a professional soldier, and he believed, as his secretary said, that God is on the side of the big battalions. And um, his hero was Alexander the Great, because he was a world conqueror, as well as a hereditary king of Macedonia. Um, now I'm going to show you some pictures of Louis XIV. Here he is young when he was thought to be very gentle, very kind, always on the side of the weak and loving ballet. <laughs> he, he danced his way through the farm. Um, between bouts of rebellion there would be wonderful court ballets near the Louvre, Ballet was a particularly adored art form at the French court. And here he is in a horse ballet, 1662, in front of the Louvre, the Cour du Carousel. It's called a carousel from these horses. And the 
the splendor of your horse and your horse trappings and the way you could control it doing this, I think it's called a, a lever, getting the horse to rise on its hind legs. It was a sign of domination, of superiority, of control and power. And here he is as a young man by his favorite artist, premier peintre du roi, Charles Lebrun, a very revealing <coughs> portrait, perhaps a slightly weak face in some ways. And he's wearing the full bottomed wig that he made fashionable. When he lost his hair through disease, at the beginning in the late 1650s, all the courtiers began to wear wigs as he did. And this is a map of France in his reign. And please note how many provinces he added to France. And these red spots are the fortresses constructed by his great engineer, Vauban, many of which Louis XIV himself visited. He's not stuck in Paris or Versailles. That is a legend. He's always on the go until 1693 to the northeast frontier um, or to the east, to Strasbourg. And he really had a strategic sense. He didn't think France should drive territory throughout Europe as Napoleon did. He knew that this, the cockpit of Europe, or the avenue of death, as the girl calls it, was really key to the security of France and of Paris. Until 1940, in 1940, the German army could get to Paris really in about a month from here. And they knew Louis XIV and his great, though, barbaric war minister, Louvois, knew that once a German emperor was tough and would get on a horse, then the menace would come from the east. That is why he expanded Flanders, Alsace, and Franche-Comté. And unlike Napoleon, he kept his conquests. And these are the journeys of his great engineer, Vauban, inspecting and building throughout France. And some of these forts that Vauban built were still very useful in the 19th century, were even being used in the First and Second World War. Some of them were even incorporated in the Maginot Line. And here he is. This is a governor's tapestry, one of the great uh, artistic achievements of his reign for founding this tapestry factory in Paris. And this is Louis XIV. <coughs> in front of Dunkirk. He knew perfectly well how important Dunkirk would be for the future in France, and he bought it from Charles II, and he visited Dunkirk five times in his reign. Well, it takes about at least three to four hours now by train or car to get from Paris to Dunkirk. Imagine how long it took in those days. And Charles II never bothered to visit Dunkirk, or they could have gone up by yacht when he owned it. Uh, Louis XIV did. He's a very serious, hard-working monarch, and he built fantastic naval defenses for Dunkirk. And it's from Dunkirk that French corsairs raided English shipping. And here he is <coughs> visiting with his wife, Marat Theresa, in the carriage. This is the king, uh, in front of Arras, the capital of Artois. All these cities were visited in state. The king and queen would go to mass. They would, um, the king would inspect the fortifications. The queen would visit convents, and they would dine in state. This is all part of some getting the locals to accept French sovereignty. And he did make this miracle of turning the people of Alsace and Flanders into Frenchmen. And here he is crossing the Rhine. This is by uh, Van der Meulen and uh, the French army. <laughs> but there was a, for some reason, the Rhine was very shallow that year. It's not that the French army was particularly brave. The, the ice hadn't melted in Switzerland or something like that. So it was quite easy to cross. And he's attacking in Holland. This is a, yet another of his wars, wars the king started himself, 1672, 1688, 1702. He's attacking Holland as a hated commercial rival. 
and there was a bit of a row about medals. They, the Dutch had published a medal claiming they'd stopped the sun in its tracks, i.e. Louis XIV. And he was so sensitive and vain that a mocking medal was almost enough to unleash a world war. And this is an arch. You can see Ludovico Magno to Louis the Great, which he, a title he formally got from the city of Paris. And um, this is the Port Saint-Martin in Paris, where he is receiving the keys of conquered cities in Franche-Comté to commemorate his conquest of Franche-Comté in 1674. That is, and he's very proud of his physical appearance. He's here as a naked Hercules with Hercules' club, and this is conquered Netherlands. I will recommend a visit to these two triumphal gates, which are rather forgotten in the middle of uh, the Troisième Arrondissement. And here he is painted by Charles Lebrun again as a Roman emperor crowned by victory in front of Douai. This picture can be seen in Douai now, another of the great Flemish cities which he made French. And here he is again by Charles Lebrun. Also again, he's putting his horse uh, through a lavar. Very important that he could do that. And here he is in Franche-Comté, again by Van der Meulen. This is the city of Besançon, which still has some of its Vauban fortifications. So he's, he's everywhere in eastern France. And this is the city of Mons, where a bit later, 1691, the great spa of Mons, which is still there, which was made so high so that the inhabitants could check in case the French army was about to attack them yet again. And here he is receiving the surrender of the city. <coughs> and here he is in front of Strasbourg, 1682, by a local artist called Constantin Frank Franken, being given the keys of Strasbourg by the city fathers. And here he's at his most statesmanlike, because he'd so terrified Alsace by his previous conquests in Flanders that they gave up, they didn't fight. There's a German-speaking city, very happy with its status as a free city of the Holy Roman Empire. Louis XIV confirms its privileges. And only the cathedral is returned to the Catholic faith. All the other churches could remain Lutheran or Calvinist. So while he's persecuting Huguenots in France, he's protecting Protestant rights in Alsace. For once, he is a statesman. He doesn't try to uh, destroy use of the German language. And in fact, Alsace rallies to this relatively light form of French rule. Here he is again visiting Flanders. Prints were made of all these great events. He had personally liberated the printmakers of Paris from the power of the guilds in 1660. And French prints at this time, particularly by Robert Nanteuil, are the best in Europe. The Voyage du Roi in 1680. He, yet again, even if there's no war, he's off with the Queen and with about 80 ladies of the court. He was so fond of female company, he dragged them with him even as far as Luxembourg, which no Parisian lady would willingly visit today. Um, and you see, again, the city fathers are on their knees in front of the King, and here are the ladies of the court. And so about 200 carriages would have followed him. And this is the siege of Mons in 1691. Again, a prince, he's surrounded by members of his family. And this is stressing that the king is in a trench himself. He's an active military leader. And you can see here somebody who's been stunned by a, the, a cannon explosion. So it's to stress that he is, in fact, in danger. And his hat emphasizes who he is. 
but I suppose the danger was probably slightly limited. He's, he's not a brave war hero like his deadly enemy, William III of Orange and England, who charges into battle um, whenever he can. Louis XIV liked these grand sieges from a distance, not too much bloodshed. He liked saving the lives of his beloved soldiers and then a grand triumphal entry into um, the conquered city. And he thought conquest power, he thought he could actually dragoon, and I use the word advisedly because he used dragoons billeting them on Protestants. He thought they could be forced into Catholicism. And this led to, this mentality led to the biggest single mistake of his reign, the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. Many Protestants conformed, but about 160,000 brilliant technicians, craftsmen, artists, diplomats, preachers, writers fled. And where did they go to? They went to the capital cities of his worst enemies, Berlin, Amsterdam, and above all, London. It's Huguenots who helped make London the financial capital of the world, the global trading capital also. And they also filled Europe with accounts of their persecutions and sufferings, rapes, murders, even burning alive in some cases. And this helps turn European opinion against Louis XIV, who'd been quite <coughs> popular when he assumed absolute power in 1661 on the death of Mazarin. France was allied to almost all of Europe except Austria. Uh, by the end of his reign, he had almost no friends left. And here he is in old age, but still with a field marshal's baton. He's in front of Namur. He took Namur in 1692. He was very proud of it because his very powerful war minister, Louvois, had died in 1691. The king, in effect, becomes his own war minister, writing letters until midnight, choosing officers, even trying to dictate plans of campaign to generals on campaign. He was a, basically a control freak, and it wasn't really very good for French armies. They began to lose battles, but he's very proud that he himself took Namur, although three years later, William III gets it back, so it's an illusory victory. And even with Madame de Montespan, his beloved mistress of the 1670s, shown here in all her glory in the Chateau de Clagny, which the king built for her and filled with this wonderful furniture and blue and white china. Even with her, there are love letters to her. Unfortunately, they were, I haven't found the originals yet, but we have what the interceptors wrote about them. He's actually writing about battles and sieges and conquests <laughs> among his passionate terms of endearment. And she, in return, when she gave him a New Year's present, it was an illuminated manuscript full of pictures of his victories and his sieges. And this is in the Orange Road, Versailles. I recommend a visit. You have to go down some steps. It's a wonderful, very unusual space architecture. This is the purple marble bath which Louis XIV and Madame de Montespan shared. Very unusual for those days to have a, a bath at all. So they could sit in the bath together. And this is the lady who replaced Madame de Montespan, the governess of her illegitimate children by Louis XIV, Madame de Maintenon, cleverer. She didn't have children, whereas Madame de Montespan did. Cleverer, calmer, no fits of temper like Madame de Montespan. She won the king's heart. She's his morganatic wife after 1683. And here, the only known picture of them together She's his unofficial consort. And what's happening? It's a great military review. The king is showing her military exercises, and she's sitting next to the king, again in one of these troops, uh, one of these prints, which the king had published and distributed around Europe. 
and he becomes cruel with age. The most civilized court in Europe, women more prominent than in any other court, and yet he begins to bombard cities even when they're neutral. This is the French bombardment of Genoa. Completely pointless, but he also bombards <coughs> Algiers, Tunis, Heidelberg, Speyer, Mannheim, along the Rhineland. He makes the valley of the Rhine into a veil of tears. And here is the Doge of Genoa. This is a picture by Pouas, the Gallery des Glaces, the grandest room in Versailles. The silver furniture, a silver throne, silver uh, <coughs> ewers and jars, all of which were later melted down to pay for his wars. Again, a rather grand theatrical gesture, it meant to inspire the reflection, oh, isn't the king wonderful? He's melting down his silver furniture. But probably it didn't really make economic sense. And here is the Doge of Genoa, who's actually come to apologize to Louis XIV for Louis XIV bombarding his city, <laughs> killing people, also destroying churches. This great pious Catholic didn't hesitate to destroy churches. Um, and he said, but he was very, very well entertained in Versailles. They didn't needlessly humiliate vanquished enemies, unlike 20th century governments at the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. Here is the king, his brother, Monsieur, his son, the Dauphin, assorted princes, a grandson, courtiers. It was so <coughs> crowded. The Gallery des Glaces, this enormous room, was so crowded with thousands of courtiers and spectators, and they were so undisciplined that the Doge and his party took about half an hour to get from one end <laughs> to the other. And the king finally had to use his cane, which is, I think it's there, to force a way through, as he often did, to force a way through the crowd of courtiers for his guests. It was an unruly court. It wasn't slavish. And the best thing about the French court is the built-in criticism and mental independence of the courtiers. While on the surface they're very, fairly respectful to the king, in the evening they're rushing back to their attics to spit venom, write poisonous memoirs like the Duc de Saint-Simon, or direct attacks on the king like Archbishop Fenelon who says France has become one big hospital. And he's in fact, in my opinion, more influential than, than later Enlightenment writers, or his books sold more than Voltaire or Rousseau in turning French opinion against an absolute extravagant, luxurious court. And he's a world conqueror. Europe is not enough. 1684, Nouvelle France here, and people go down all the valley of the Mississippi and claim it for France. They put um, uh, the coat of arms of Louis XIV and they say this is now the king's property. Here you see a later map. <laughs> this is all Nouvelle France and all this valley was meant to be full of happy French farmers, but they didn't come. The French government tried to persuade people to come. It's part of the reason for Law's scheme, the Mississippi scheme in 1720, which in fact bankrupts France. Maybe the Ancien Regime wasn't so bad and so many French people living in the country had their own patch of land they didn't want to leave. Or maybe the climate here wasn't really very good, despite all the prospectuses published in Paris saying it was perfect for agriculture. So that is why, one reason, apart from defeat, why North America speaks English and not French. But it wasn't for lack of trying by the government of Louis XIV and his successors. And then America in the West, in the East, Siam. They had relations since the 1660s. 1684, a French embassy goes to Siam by boat because he's made the Navy far better than it was. J. 
Jesuits come with them, paid for personally by Louis XIV, to spread Catholicism and to try and convert the king of Siam called Fra Narai. And there's a return embassy. This is a drawing by Charles Lebrun, 1686, the Siamese ambassadors, <coughs> again in the Galerie des Glaces. And I'd like to read you a dialogue between kings. The king of Siam, the king of France. Uh, again, as with the Genoese ambassadors, Jean de Plantevide writes, the crowd was unbelievable and seemed to shock and offend the majesty of the prince. In France, our kings are used to being overwhelmed by the crowd, which is their grandeur. And they said, the king is wearing jewels on his coat, which are worth more than the entire kingdom of Siam. And he was, they were rather shocked by the kowtowing. Even Louis XIV didn't like that. Um, they praise, uh, they praise Louis XIV as the king who has conquered all his enemies. And Louis XIV had told the king of Siam that Catholicism was the highest, the most noble, the most holy, and above all, the religion most suited to enable kings to reign absolutely over their peoples. Please note the culminating, to reign absolutely over their peoples. That is what really went to the heart of Louis XIV. And Franarai replied that if God had really wanted to be worshipped everywhere in the same way, he would not have made people so different and following so many different religions. So Asia was giving a lesson to Europe as so often. Um, and in fact, Louis XIV overreached himself in Siam as he did with the Protestants. His troops, he had about a thousand troops in Bangkok. They tried to take over the kingdom in 1688. There was a revolt <coughs> against French influence, encouraged by, of course, the Dutch. And Fran Arai, the pro-French king, was deposed and for the next century and a half, Siam became, the French were sent back, Siam became a hermit kingdom, closed to the outside world. Now the ambassadors are again. It's a ter terrific event, but what remains are some wonderful descriptions by French Jesuits, which are still used by Thai historians today. And Louis XIV is very keen on trade. He's, he personally forces people to invest in his trading companies. He asks the merchants of Lille, for example, what he can do for trade. And this is a famous, um, really, business handbook on currencies, how to avoid bankruptcies, how to avoid bad debts, etc. by Jacques Savary. Its first edition was 1675 in Paris, and it's later printed in Geneva here and translated into English, Dutch, German, Russian. So it's France teaching trade to the rest of the world, not the other way around. And if France hadn't had so many wars, I think its trade would have probably, uh, wars and revolutions, its trade in the 1780s was about to overtake England's. And now I'll just show you Versailles. Versailles is also an attempt at conquest, to conquer time, to make the best palace in the world, better than any <coughs> palace in the Roman Empire. There's a slight sense of inferiority of the French feeling of maybe the palaces in Rome are better. We've got to try hard. And Louis XIV certainly intended it as a memorial to himself and a guarantee of his fame. Here are some prints of Parties in 1664, the best fireworks in Europe. He's conquering night as well as day. A lady of the court, the Comtesse de Soissons, he's always surrounded by women, and he particularly liked it if they could ride and follow him hunting. This is in front of the palace of Vincennes. Uh, the Duchesse de Bouillon, they're both nieces of Mazarin. These series of the ladies of the court can be found in Sweden, in many museums in France. They were mass reproduced. 
Here the king is hunting in front of Murdon, his son's palace, and he's followed again by the ladies of the court in side saddle. Here he is, I apologize for the reproduction, as founder of the Academy of Science by Henri Testelin, 1666, with the great Colbert beside him, the minister who's really in charge of everything, finance, culture, even looking after the king's illegitimate children. Early Versailles by Patel about 1666 or 8, really one of the best views. And here you see the king's coach arriving, horses waiting for another coach, the guards who are always with him wherever he goes. This is Versailles being constructed about 1680, again by Pierre Patel. This is Colbert in charge of the construction. There are desperate letters for him, from him to the king and from him to his son saying, we've got to be quicker, we've got to be quicker. The king's coming down to inspect. You must make sure the king's bedroom, the gilding has been finished and so on. This is the man who's also in charge of the, bu the national budget. Um, here is Versailles again, the king, some of the reservoirs, and this is called l'hôtel du Chenil. This is where the hunting dogs of the king were kept. Because Versailles is not only a royal residence, a government center, a military headquarters, a non-stop concert, a musical festival, fashion show, a marriage market, much else. It's also, and above all, a field sports center for the royal family. It was originally a hunting lodge, and it never lost that purpose. And here you see a view from the palace of Versailles. And this gives, again by Patel, this gives some idea of the activity in the court. This is the Grande Écurie, filled with horses for the court, which you can visit today, and it's got carriages, but most of the royal carriages were destroyed in the revolution, so it's 19th century carriages. This is the Petite Écurie for carriages and the king's personal horses. These are the Swiss guards in red, the French guards in blue, lined up for a review. It's the desertion of the French guards in 1789, which really is the key to the success of the French Revolution and the fall of the Bastille. And these are the people in sedan chairs, ladies, gentlemen, who are allowed to enter the royal courtyard of the palace. People looking out of what was in fact Madame de Maintenon's apartment. And this is a view of the orange ring, <coughs> Madame de Montespan's bath can be seen, and about 2,000 orange trees at the, at the, <coughs> under Louis XIV's reign. And the orangery inside, it's like the naves of several cathedrals run together. It is a, but absolutely pure, stark stone. It's a, a magnificent sight. This is the garden front of the palace. Here he is in the gardens. This is his private paradise called Marly, now destroyed. Even Louis XIV got fed up with Versailles. It was too much for him. So from 1685, he began to spend more and more time in Marly, which was more informal, less etiquette rules. You could sit down in his presence. Uh, guests could order brandy or wine or whatever they wanted. It was a gambling den, and these are the houses for his guests, so they could be quite independent. It's, and by the end of his reign, he's spending a third of the year at Marley, a, a fugitive from his own court, in fact. So he's, Marie Antoinette is later accused of doing things, which Louis XIV had done on a far greater scale, in fact. The difference was everyone was terrified of Louis XIV and accepted it. And he had more friends to Marley than she had to the Petit Trianon. 
This is the machine de Marly raising water from the Seine to an aqueduct to feed the fountains of Marly. It's a complete folly. Thousands of soldiers died building it. Um, normally, people chose a site for their palaces somewhere with a lot of water so the fountains could run easily. Sort of Peter the Great at Peterhof. The fountains don't need these machines, but it's also revealing of Louis XIV's character. He had to show that he was more powerful than nature, that he could change the flow of water, the shape of mountains and hillsides, and so on. Um, and here is a plan of Versailles at the end of his reign. It's a complete universe. This is the, this is the town. This is a, a water reservoir. This is the park, which hasn't changed that much since his reign. The, the Grand Canal is so big that he could, in fact, see naval demonstrations on it or test new types of ships on it. And the Doge of Venice gave him gondolas. The King of England gave him yachts, which you could have on the Grand Canal. And round here, there were and here, the, the Grand Parc were full of faisanderie, of pheasant rearing uh, areas, so the birds would be released so that the king and his family could go shooting. And he went shooting many days of the year. And these are some recently discovered views of Versailles. Uh, at, when he's finished it, 1690 roughly by Adam Perel. How he managed to make bird's eye views, I have no idea, but uh, I think the most realistic views that are, this is the Grand Commun of the main kitchens, now the research center of Versailles. These are houses for courtiers. These are the stables you've seen, and this is the park. And really what is most extraordinary about Versailles, not the palace itself, it's these two wings. One is for the royal family, the Orléans, the Condé cousins, the Conti cousins, and the other are for courtiers. One attic corridor is called the Rue de Noailles because so many members of the Noailles family um, live there. So there's more room for courtiers and relations than in any other palace. Everybody's together, at least for half the year. Now you see the garden view, three avenues, uh, Saint-Cloud, Paris, and so. And a side view, the orangery, and the gardens. Here's a view of the gardens. And they're more alive now than ever. There are concerts, there are fireworks displays, as there were under Louis XIV. The palace itself is full of operas, private receptions, uh, fashion shows, anything to make money to keep up the fabric of the palace. So in a way, Louis XIV has the last laugh because <laughs> his palace is more visited than any other palace in the world except that of his friend, the Emperor of China, the Forbidden City. There he is. Uh, here he is in a wheelchair at the end of his life. Um, and at the end of his life, when he's after the war of the Spanish succession, when he's friends with Queen Anne, he, he sends her a version of his own wheelchair. The two old monarchs exchange wheelchairs. <laughs> and this is Le Nôtre, his great gardener. And he's at his most human when he's with great artists, or in this case, landscape gardens. He allowed Le Nôtre to go around the park of Versailles beside himself in a similar wheelchair. So that's a tremendous honor. Uh, the Nôtre nearly died of joy. <laughs> and here he is with the architect Mozart, again shown almost as the equal of the king. No other king would have had an artist almost as his equal, with behind the Hôtel des Invalides, one of the most extraordinary buildings of his reign, which you can visit now. This is saint Cloud, his brother's palace, all gone now, the Franco-Prussian War, just west of Paris. This is an example of his furniture, always with 
his own effigy, the Bull Furniture, which he personally encouraged and which then became fashionable throughout Europe. Another example. More and more statues of the king were erected in towns around France. That's the statue in Lyon. This is a tapestry woven by the workshop of Madame de Montespan, showing the king as Jupiter with thunderbolts. And this engagement with the world that I've talked about before, not just Siam, but also the Ottoman Empire and Persia. This is one of his jewelers called Tavernier in Persian dress. He dedicated his travel book to Louis XIV, as many people did, and talked about his travels with the king at his public dinner when people filed past and anybody interesting he would talk to and he would ask questions about the Mississippi or Persia or what's happening in India. And China, the 1690s, these Jesuits are sent as mathematicians and astronomers to China. Here he is, Bouvet of the Company of Jesus, and they begin to write portrait of the Emperor of China presented to the king and of course Bouvet says that if it were not for your majesty the Emperor of China would be the finest most dignified most model ruler of the world but there is a genuine attempt to know China to learn China the first description of Confucius and Confucianism is, dedica is dedicated to Louis XIV in Paris in the 1680s and the, one of the early Chinese converts to Catholicism, called Michel Shen Fong, comes to Versailles, 1684, wearing Chinese costume, and he eats with chopsticks in front of the royal family. I was curious to see it. And here are some of the illustrations of Bouvet's book, where they're sort of acclimatized to French, the difference between warriors and legal officials, officiers de haut, <coughs> and more. And blue and white China, and the first French boats go directly from Nantes or Lorient to Canton and bring back blue and white China. And Spain, he's also engaged with, but part of the, one of the themes of his reign is the desire to inherit the Spanish monarchy, a global monarchy stretching from the Philippines to Peru. And here he is, 1660. This is another governor's tapestry, the King of Spain and his bride, Maria Teresa Infanta of Spain, who brought with her a claim to the Spanish throne. 1700, her half-brother dies, leaving the Spanish crown to one of Louis XIV's grandsons, the Duc d'Anjou, and it was an offer too good to refuse and above all so wonderful he could not possibly allow his enemies the austrian habsburgs who were the next claimants to inherit it instead of the bourbons this is a later picture by gerard showing the king presenting his young grandson the duke d'anjou now who became philip v of spain to the spanish ambassador in versailles one of the great moments of Versailles, November 1700, and the Bourbons of Spain, Philip V in particular, were more of a success than people thought. He puts on Spanish costume because he's young, brave, uh, relatively good looking compared to the decayed Habsburgs that Spain had been ruled by. He becomes beloved in Castile, not in Catalonia, and he wins the war of the Spanish succession, partly due to the quality of his troops and the loyalty of the Spanish. And indeed, his descendant is Philip VI, King of Spain, today. Though even then, the last battles of Louis XIV's reign are fought against Barcelona, the Franco-Spanish uh, destruction of Barcelona, which supported the other side, the Austrians, and um, 
had rebelled against Philip V. And it's said that Catalan nationalists today have in the offices busts of the Austrian candidate for the <laughs> Spanish throne, Charles VI. Here is the war of the Spanish succession everywhere. Marlborough leading a European army. England led a European coalition against um, France, which as usual with these coalitions, the British are in a minority. And of course, Marlborough wins many battles, Blenheim, Ramillies, Lille, uh, Oudenard, Malplaquet, and so on. And France is really on its knees by 1710. There's even a Protestant uprising in these mountains. But it is saved in part by the alliance with the Ottoman Empire, because the Ottoman Empire was then a, a very productive agriculturally, and it's weak from the Ottoman Empire, organized by the French ambassador to Constantinople, which feeds France in 1709, 1710, when there's a terrible harvests, terrible winter, people are dying in the fields, and the English, the Duke of Marlborough, really thinks he's going to get to Paris and dictate terms and impose a States General on Louis XIV. This is a picture of the French ambassador in Constantinople visiting Athens, just to show you how close the connection was. Here's the French ambassador, his brother, his party. And this is a picture that's only just been discovered this year of the French ambassador in front of Jerusalem. He's touring the Ottoman Empire in the 1670s. And again, wonderful French books on the Ottoman Empire as there were on China and Siam. And the first translation of the Thousand and One Nights is by a Frenchman living in the French embassy. You see this picture again. The first accurate view of Jerusalem is due to the French, the ambassador of Louis XIV, with his Janissary escort, grooms, and so on. More books about Istanbul. Uh, here is a view of costumes in Turkey organized by his ambassador in Constantinople. He is the man who organized the grain supplies from Greece and Egypt and Syria for France. Here are these extraordinary pictures of the different costumes of Constantinople, which you can see in a room in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam called the Turkish Cabinet. And England, last but not least. Here is a picture by Jean Nocre of the French royal family, the king, his wife, his mother, and in the corner is Henrietta Maria, widow of Charles I. Why is she there? Because she's a French princess. She's his aunt and mother-in-law of his younger brother, Monsieur. That is Henriette Anne, Madame, who <coughs> was very popular extremely cultivated, treated her servants as human beings, and is a key negotiator of the secret treaty of Dover between Charles II and Louis XIV, which started a French-British alliance to attack the Netherlands. 1670s, and who is one of the leading officers in the <coughs> British forces serving with the French in <coughs> the Netherlands? It is the young John Churchill future Duke of Marlborough. He learns a lot from the French army and from Turenne, who, who believed in rapid marches and flexible strategy. So this moment of alliance is often forgotten. And Louis XIV's secret weapon, this is the picture by de Troy, which is no longer, not in the National Portrait Gallery at the moment. This is the Duchess of Portsmouth and Aubigny, the beloved mistress of Charles II, who corresponded personally with Louis XIV about what her royal lover was up to and is constantly rewarded with um, presence by Louis XIV as well as Charles II. And I wonder what her African servant and the pearls, what they signify in the coral. If anybody knows, please tell me. It may be the sea and um, she's always crossing 
the channel between France and England, going to inspect the estates. The money Charles II had given her, she wisely invested in estates in France, knowing that she would not be so popular in England after Charles II died. But she is the ancestress of the Dukes of Richmond, and a lot of her treasures are at Goodwood to this day. 1688, England changes sides. This is the fleet of William III leaving for England. One of the most successful amphibian operations in history. Um, James II is hopeless. Louis XIV is also fairly hopeless because he attacks the Rhineland instead of aiding James II or threatening William III in the Netherlands. November 1688, as William III is advancing on London, Louis XIV is riding through the forest at Fontainebleau, followed by a cavalcade of ladies on horseback. <laughs> this is another fascinating Franco-British figure, one of Louis XIV's favorites, the Duke de Lausanne, who um, who'd been imprisoned for 10 years for various acts of insolence, but in 1688 he goes to England and personally escorts James II's wife and son, Mary of Modena, and the future old pretender, to Paris, to France. And as a reward, he's made a Knight of the Garter. These are the robes of a Jacobite Knight of the Garter appointed in France. And he becomes James II's chief advisor in France. That's by Alexis Bell. Here is James II and his wife, son, and daughter in exile, 1692 by Mignard, again the Jacobite robes of the Knight of the Garter. They went on appointing peers and Knights of the Garter, a full-blown court, government, and army in exile. The two children by La Gilière, the old pretender, and Louise Marie, known as La Consolatrice, and these are the pictures in the National Portrait Gallery by Blanchet, a French artist, of the young pretender. Um, he wears the red heels, which Louis XIV had introduced at the French court. Very much French protégés for the throne of England. Trouble to, to turn on the Hanoverians when there's a war in Europe. But William III was really cleverer than Louis XIV. He won England without almost a shot being fired in anger, and uses British resources for his great life mission, which is to diminish the power of France in Europe. The Duke of Marlborough, by Clusterman in the Royal Hospital Chelsea, we see his portraits uh, even more triumphalist, really, than Louis XIV's. He was an extremely ambitious, general as successful as a diplomat as he was as a general and who knows to what he would have aspired if he'd had a, a son but his son died young but in contrast to Marlborough there is Bolingbroke the Tory leader who in 1710 to 12 betrays Britain's allies makes a sudden peace with Louis XIV behind the backs of the Dutch and Austria and in the end works for the old pretender and lives in France and marries a French woman and in fact becomes a friend and model for Voltaire. So there's two sides of England, Francophobia and also Francophilia. This is his negotiator, Matthew Pryor, a sign of a diplomat documents and seals and um, he, it, the Treaty of Utrecht was called Matt's Peace because he was so important in negotiating. An English diplomat painted by a French artist in Paris. The end of the reign, I apologize for this quality. This is the, a Saxon prince being presented to Louis XIV in old age. And um, global to the end, this is the last great reception in the Galerie des Glaces. The throne is no longer silver. The king, 1715, he's 78, with his nephew. And these are Persian ambassadors. 
and that in France to negotiate a trade agreement and also the Arabian Gulf is in the news today, it was in the news then also. The Persians wanted a Franco-Persian alliance to turn against the Arab rulers of Muscat and Hormuz and grab those areas for Persia. And so all these, many of these issues, the nature of union between European states, people already talked about it in 1713, the Persian Gulf, Catalonia, and also Scotland, because Louis XIV is always trying to stir up trouble in Scotland. There were issues then, and there are issues now. And this is the last great picture of Louis XIV and his family. It is four generations, the Dauphin, the Duke of Burgundy. If he'd lived, he would have been a great reformer, would probably have introduced the States General, and the future Louis XV. And this is his governess, the Duchesse de Montadour, and she commissioned this picture, a unique in the history of France, four generations and a courtier. And it says two things, I think. A, with, this commemorates sudden deaths in the royal family. 1712, 1711 the Dauphin, 1712 the Duc de Bourgogne, and a little brother of Louis XV, and 1715 the king. All deaths attributed by courtiers and public opinion to the bad royal doctors. The court doctors were appalling, worse than Paris doctors, and people really thought that if Dr. Fagon hadn't been around, Louis XIV could have lived even longer than he did. The Dauphin, for example, died so suddenly he didn't have the last rites. Um, but the Duchesse de Ventadour kept her charge away from the royal doctors. She removed him physically and fed him on her own recipe, biscuits soaked in wine. And so Louis XV lived until 1774 for good or ill. And I think this picture is a sign of the independence of courtiers. We focus so much on the royal family, but in fact the courtiers are often pulling the strings behind uh, the scenes, more than we imagine courtiers and above all ministers. Nothing went right for Louis XIV after Colbert died in 1683. And um, it's she who had copied for her young charge Louis XIV's dying words that he had loved war too much and he must help the people. And this was these words in perfect calligraphy by the royal calligrapher were hung by his bed. But I'm not sure he really listened to good advice, and no one ever listens to good advice. And this is the last picture. This is the funeral procession of Louis XIV going to Saint Denis. And so I hope I have shown to you the variety and importance of Louis XIV's reign, and that he's closely connected to almost every nation in Europe. Thank you very much. Charles II. Yes. Is that our Charles II? Yes. I didn't think we had any French possessions when that time. I thought Calais was the last one. Cromwell had got back Dunkirk when fighting as an ally of France in against Spain. So for a few years, 1657 to 1662, Dunkirk was English. Yes. Which side were we? Um, we, we, were, we were attacking France. We were with the Netherlands, Austria, and many German powers attacking France. 
because they were terrified that France and Spain would practically become one country, which in fact was an exaggerated fear. But Louis XIV had done many tactless acts to alienate opinion. For example, he recognized the old pretender as King of England. So all these victories that Marlborough had, at the end of the day, Louis XIV got his way. Louis XIV got his way in Spain, and yes, you are completely right. Louis XIV, in fact, won the war of the Spanish succession, but but he lost a few cities in the Spanish Netherlands, like Tournai and Ypres and Mons, which at that time people thought were well worth fighting for. Okay, thank you so much. Just for